Lucy, thank you everyone for coming. We have a lot to get through today because I tend to pack my slides with all kinds of juicy information. Um, I, uh, and so I encourage people to screenshot also because we may go faster over something that you have a great interest in. I saw that we're a little over a third of, of local governments and that's always great to hear because um, I think these policies are working and I think, well, we'll see how they work with COVID. We've stumbled a little bit with COVID for obvious reasons, but they're coming on quickly. And um, I think that we're going to be making really great progress as soon as we navigate um, COVID as a challenge. And then of course, all the other challenges that come along with behavior change and getting systems and logistics and suppliers in place. Um, I do think that we are going to have a lot of demand and the supply will be outstripped by the demand for a while as we get this going, but there's all kinds of remarkable pilots and people that are in this field and really making things happen. Um, so I am, I'm a zero waste specialist. I get to help craft policy, but um, I, I think the juicy part of my work is working in implementation of the policies and stakeholder outreach. And I love reuse. Um, I come from a creative design background. I worked in consumer goods and worked with other kinds of clients for over 25 years. And I understand supply chain and I also understand customers and I understand, um, and I understand convenience. And that is probably I think that's one of our biggest challenges is uh, people wanting convenience and wanting to not pay a lot of money for what they're getting. So anyway, that is a challenge. And um, I wanted to point out this, this roadmap that's here. It's actually a mural board from a recent Google sprint that we did. And it was facilitated by a wonderful woman who's a founder and CEO of Remark.eco. They'll be launching a phone app soon, but I started to, to be in touch with her because they had a service where you could text to them with a complaint or a, a remark, um, positive or negative about a business that you felt was doing well or maybe could do better in sustainability. And they would help you find the correct person to talk to and craft an email to them. And now she will have a phone app that is launching soon. It's being beta tested and um, it will be an amazing tool for helping us in Berkeley to continue to harness the power of our incredibly engaged citizens here that really supported this ordinance. And so um, that is what happens when you put together six passionate people, uh, colleagues that work in this field, take in some expert interviews from food service providers and spend the time um, figuring out where you could go, what the impediments were, what the challenges were, uh, what the possibilities are. And I really do recommend these the Google Sprint as a way to pull in different stakeholders for your communities to uh, figure out what paths forward could be. It's also individual, as we know, every municipality, every city, every state. So with that said, on we go. And thank you everybody for being on the webinar because I had, I have never been on so many webinars in the last six months as I have been on since the middle of March. So the obvious goal in this is that we want to reduce the amount of discards in our waste stream. And especially um, we can see the amount of unnecessary single use items that are coming in. I think we know with COVID, we have seen um, obviously something we never intended. We saw uh, the, the mounting PPE which seems to take precedence over everything because we know that's about uh, protecting people from, from the spread in the pandemic. But we're seeing a huge amount of unnecessary single-use items in foodware, as well as you know, fiber cartons from shipping. But we've been working on the single-use item of disposable foodware, especially the bad actors of uh, plastic, because we're all aware of the amount of pollution that makes it into our environment because of plastics, which tend to have a much lower value and um, are largely unrecyclable, especially those in the, that are in the, the foodware stream. So how we get there, um, there's a growing list, things that were already, already we knew and things that we are addressing further with the events of this past year, including um, equity issues and including some, some time spent knowing what the feedback was and growing, um, and growing supply. Um, so I've been working with Miriam Gordon, 
um, as a, a, a colleague who is the policy director at Upstream Solutions. And that is a, a nonprofit organization that has a huge amount of resources available for on policy, on, on, on networks available, case studies. Uh, it goes on and on. It's just such a valuable resource. And she is forever looking at best practices and listening to what's going on and uh, starting to, to, again, drill down on um, things like opt-in policies for delivery systems. That is in the Berkeley Ordinance, but we had no idea how important that would become now that we've seen how the growth of that sector of delivery, of food delivery. And, um, and so this is, we continue to add to this and, um, as I said, really heading toward reuse and the circular uh, economy model. So these are elements of what would be a good reuse policy. Um, it's difficult possibly to get all of them in, but I think that if you're gonna shoot for a good policy, you should kind of shoot for the moon and then end up governing more by exception about what's not working. And that is something that we, we absolutely tried to do with the Berkeley policy. And, uh, and, and learning as we go about things like the grace periods, the rollout periods, um, how, how it works to have a shorter one or a longer one, that's all been debated. So if we look through all these different things, we can see that they really would chip away at the amount of single use disposable foodware, and especially the bad actor materials, the polystyrenes and the plastics. And we, we are seeing a lot of, of municipalities that are adopting policies that have compostables, but they don't um, mandate reusables. And that really would be the gold standard because that is the requirement and the mandate for reusables, especially starting to target how, uh, how much of what is offered is a reusable. And that is, would be part of a, uh, a slower rollout and an implementation that can still grow. So you get to the point of mandating across the board uh, who uses reusables and how, what percentage have to be reusables. So this is from Upstream, and I think that if I haven't convinced you now or you don't know that reuse wins, reuse really does. Reuse is the, uh, the primary path, I think, to reduction. Um, I think that we, as a designer, I'm fascinated by reuse. Um, it's a challenge, and it's a great design challenge, and it's a systems challenge, and it, um, it helps grow uh, the green sector and entrepreneurs. I mean, there's, there's a lot of expansion that can happen here. It really will rely though on behavior change. Um, it does save money. That is the one thing that is very clear is that reuse saves money. Um, there are case studies on this. There are many, many restaurants that have been converted and I'll speak to that people that specialize in that, but um, reuse does win and that is where we need to head. And I'm going to talk a little bit now about what is called the Berkeley model, because this is a first in the nation foodware ordinance. And this is something that came together over several years and it involved activists and experts and people like uh, Martin Bork at the Ecology Center and of course uh, Miriam Gordon and Rethink Disposable, which is a program of clean water action. And this was put together with a lot of effort to bring it to council and to have a workable policy that could get passed. And so it was passed in, let's see, I think it went, it was passed in early part of 2019 and it went on the books, I think March 27th. And there were, it was phased. So it's tiered, it's phased, and there's a rollout with grace periods of um, effective dates, well, effective dates and then one year grace periods, except for phase one. A phase one was supposed to be immediate, but of course there is the time involved with rolling it out to the restaurants. I wanna talk a tiny bit about how this happened, is that um, we had a very, very engaged um, elected official and then we had a community that has a history of activism, a history of early adoption, and a history of, uh, and, and a history of very engaged citizenry that really were, was always, we were always looking for how we would move forward, very progressive ideals. So Berkeley was a really good place to take this up. And it, um, 
it involved a really interesting process of, of getting a tight policy, bringing it to a um, councilwoman who is now the, a newly reelected councilwoman, and now she's the vice mayor of Berkeley, Sophie Hahn. And she was a true champion, and she was backed by Mayor Jesse Adegin, who also just was reelected, which is really wonderful for our city. They're, they're great leaders for our um, environment, for our climate. And we did um, an extensive outreach process because Berkeley has many, many commissions, and you have to be appointed to the commission. I was appointed by uh, Vice Mayor Hahn to the Zero Waste Commission, and I served as vice chair and then chair and was able to participate in this process when council decided to refer the initial ordinance that was proposed to commission to do the vetting, to do the stakeholder um, input and all of the outreach and gather all of the information to bring it back to council with recommendations. And that was about a five month period of extended commission meetings and public meetings at different times of the day, different parts of the city. And we had, uh, we did a lot of business outreach, online survey. I was part of a survey process through uh, Rethink Disposable to go talk to businesses. And I would say that for the most part, most people said that if it was fair across the board, then they would, they would be up for it, the businesses. And that really helped to have all of this input to be able to pass it, as well as the fact that we had an elected official that attended everything and she continued to revise and modify and basically improve the ordinance as she went. So that there wasn't a big lag when it finally came back to council with our recommendations. It wasn't like, okay, now we start that work. The work was ongoing, the outreach was ongoing, the meeting with different restaurants and also hearing from disadvantaged communities um, the disabled community, lower income communities, our unhoused population, um, a variety of things that, that did shape the policy. So you really have to listen to your stakeholders and you have to look at what your facilities are um, that will accept different kinds of waste as in compostables and what those compostable materials can be. If you don't have a facility that accepts bioplastics, for instance, then you probably shouldn't allow bioplastics as one of your compostables. So this was phase one, and I'm letting you read it. Again, feel free to screenshot. And then phase two, as you can see, they were, um, they were rolled out at different times. We are not in any enforcement period uh, of any of the phases except the initial one. But I would say that right now with COVID, nobody is really thinking about this. Um, we, are, we are challenged with our staffing. Um, the uh, other departments that are trying to just keep things afloat in Berkeley, um, they, are, they are not tasked with enforcing anything. Uh, right now, I think it's just kind of all hands on deck and trying to see what our business community will look like. Um, I think there are estimates that we may lose about 40% of our restaurants because we are a, uh, a student population too. And what flows in and out of a university between staff and students is a lot of traffic that is now not, uh, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not going to restaurants, they're not going to cafes. And so it does make it difficult to enforce some of these because say with BYO, if people aren't accepting your cups, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to charge for a compostable. And so we, we're just, we're a little bit on hold, but nothing has been rolled back yet. Nothing has been pushed out any further um, everyone is kind of waiting to see where this is going to land. Uh, we're, we are not post-COVID. And, um, and just again, I think pivoting and being nimble is, that's clearly become the name of the game right now for a variety of sectors. So these were some of the lessons that, uh, or the information and the lessons learned from the processes, trying to respond to people. Um, and these were all ended up being put into the final uh, ordinance and it served as a model. Marin County is adopting it almost exactly, except they cannot accept bioplastics in their stream. And this was set to be heard by the, the county. And of course it was put on hold. It will be heard now, uh, most likely, we're hoping fall, but uh, well, I'm, no, we're in fall, spring. It's been moved to spring, but they were poised. Um, 
to just pass the same one. And as a county, they were only able to speak as counties usually are for a, an unincorporated area. And a county like Marin County or San Mateo uh, County, they have a lot of unincorporated areas. And so if you set a really strong policy at a county level, then you can uh, set an example and ask your cities to please participate in the exact same ordinance so that there will be continuity and consistency across your county. This was something that came up with Berkeley is because we are an urban environment and we have three other cities that border Berkeley, that someone could feasibly walk across the street and get a coffee that doesn't have a 25 cent charge attached to their disposable cup. Whereas a county like Marin County, which is across the bridge in the Bay Area, across the Golden Gate Bridge and the Richmond Bridge, uh, it is a very car-based county. And so someone could actually just decide to drive from one small city to the next, it would be a half mile away. And they could decide that they were going to select a cafe that didn't have a charge. And so it's very important for counties like that where people can make choices with ease based on um, you know, transportation, based on a charge that they could start and uh, patronize another coffee house in, you know, in a neighboring community. So it is really good to have that kind of congruous approach, uh, city and countywide. We did work heavily with the different vendors. This is Top Dog in Berkeley, which is a tiny, tiny little hot dog, hot dog stand that has been around since I was in college, way back when at Cal. And so there are space constraints. Um, there are issues around this. And we did, therefore, look at the ordinance and figure out how to adapt it through waivers, through um, uh, technical assistance and mini grants for either equipment or the reusable wear or the services that could come pick it up. Top Dog had a funny one because they actually were, uh, they were adverse to durables uh, using reusables on site because unfortunately a lot of drunk students come and end up throwing things at them. That was the first I'd heard of that. I'm not really sure what you do about something like that, but it's always interesting to have these anecdotes. I mean, you have to listen to them, um, but if it, it doesn't represent the vast majority of the businesses, then I probably wouldn't write it into an ordinance. Right now we are running into the fact that anything that is perceived as a, as a potential cost increase to the business or the customer, anything that could drive uh, survivability down or is unsafe or unsanitary, people will not buy into that. But I have heard from Rethink Disposable, we'll talk about that it specializes in a conversion to reusables and is contracted with Berkeley and several other cities to help businesses do conversions. I have heard that week by week it is improving, that they're getting more interest as each week passes. And I think that is probably a very good sign. It also adheres to what our health departments are allowing. They are allowing customers to um, also bring their own reusables as long as there's no touching by employees. So I'm starting to see more interest based on, I guess, some more confidence in what the health departments are issuing. So these are cities that have since passed, which is really fantastic since we are, let's say they're about a year out. Though Arcata, just which is up in Northern California, they just came on board very recently, even in the midst of this pandemic, and they're still passing legislation. So that's fantastic. Same with Half Moon Bay. But a lot of these people passed it fairly quickly. And what they did is they, um, they put re a reusable mandate into the ordinance, as well as compostables, as well as a charge. And those are probably the three very important things. Half Moon Bay gets a little few points off for no charges on food work. But remember, everything can be amended. And um, as soon as you start proving your case, you can work toward amending policy and continue to approve it. That is the, uh, right there is the graphic that we will be putting out for Berkeley as soon as we feel that we're on a little more stable ground to bring the 25 cent charge forward. We also have communities that have brought on uh, compostables. They mandated compostables, including vans on the uh, PFAS, and uh, we, we use BP, BPI certification as our measure in Berkeley. Um, I think that, that is probably, again, a gold standard right now, and they maintain a very good list that's growing. We're seeing more and more compostable wear available. Note that most 
many, many facilities do not accept bioplastics. Berkeley's, Berkeley uses Recology, as does San Francisco, and we do have that capability to process, but one of the big problems is that right now, since there is no consistent marking for a compostable plastic versus, which is a bioplastic, largely corn-based, versus a petroleum-based plastic, they are often getting screened out either on a hand line or they haven't broken down enough, they're getting screened out mechanically. So we don't know how many of these compostables are actually making it into a compost pile and or a compost facility. And moreover, we don't even know how many are making it into the right bin. And that is one of the issues about changing to a compostable from a, a, an ostensibly recyclable single-use foodware item is that uh, you do have to rely on a consumer to know which bin it goes in and then you have to rely on your hauler to put them all in the right bin and you have to rely on the case of Berkeley or anyone else enacting this ordinance that they have to have correctly marked bins out. So there's a lot of variables along that chain of getting it to the right place. And in a state like California, we absolutely need to take a lead on this at all levels because we have a, a state law called AB 1383, which is to limit short-lived climate pollutants, which is methane, out of landfill. And all of these compostables will end up off-gassing um, any organic material will off-gas in landfill. So Again, when you, when you mind map this, do a chart and do the math and draw your arrows and circles and try and figure it out and do your Venn diagrams, everything comes back to reuse really, really is gonna solve many of our problems and move us forward to a healthy ecosystem and to a, a decrease in carbon emissions. So we are still very, very hopeful that all of these policies will continue to amend themselves and update themselves and mandate reusables, at least some percentage. San Mateo County, um, I'm bringing them up. They do not mandate reusables on site for any on-site dining or in a delivery system, et cetera. Um, but they did, they were very actively watching and coming to the meetings that we held in Berkeley. And this, or they were crafting an ordinance that they could put together, that they felt they could work with, that they felt that could be amended further down, that they could get their cities to buy into. And they also, they can't take the PLA. But they also did provide, and mind you, after they did that, South San Francisco, Berlin Games, several of, five of their cities, um, though something's pending, but that's this month, they all bought into the, um, they bought into this and they uh, helped, uh, Half Moon Bay improved on it. And they did put money into this for county reuse programs. So they did back up their support for reusables by uh, allocating funds and working on pilots and putting out, which is incredibly important. When this happens, this means that RFPs are starting to be issued. And when you have a request for, for a proposal that goes out, to services that can provide sustainable, reusable wear and logistics and systems that really helps this growing sector of entrepreneurs to get financing and to get investors. If they can basically go to an investor and say, look, I have an RFP, I, I have a project, this is gonna happen, I'm going to be bringing money in, you can invest in us. It is incredibly important to to do that, that the governments buy into this and basically put some money where their mouth is so that it can help to grow this sector because we'll need, we need these systems, we need these logistics, we need this where. We need to make it very convenient so that ultimately even cost is not a barrier for the user. It is convenient and it is not expensive. If in fact, basically free. This should be able to be put into pricing through, through the restaurants and through the services. So using a policy like that, we can get somewhere. We actually can keep building, get rid of the bad actors and just keep improving all the time with better data, better systems and proof that these systems do work. So this is from Upstream. Um, again, I, I just can't say enough good things about them, but this is basically what we want to get to, you know, a, a, a community where we don't have disposables. We don't throw things away. Um, I mean, we're, we're, 
we need to be resourceful. We need to respect our upstream and not just haul it around in our downstream. So upstream really works um, about policy, about you know, extended some extended responsibility for people that are producing some kind of stewardship redesign so that, that what we are left with is things that we can use again and put them back into the economy and not things that have to go be buried or burned which is basically no burn no bury no toxins that is the mantra of zero waste and um, that's what we need to move to so this is from upstream um i think that there is nothing here that i haven't really covered um, those would be your four steps. So there are complicated four steps. I don't take them lightly, but we really do need to also, um, and we're looking at design change, like number four. I've seen a lot of work in compostable materials and flex packaging, which is what the Doritos bag is. But again, the problem is, is it still looks like the petroleum based products and it doesn't have a great compost, uh, compost, breakdown it probably takes longer than these industrial piles are um are you know when they're in their process they they need to be moved along and if if they can't break down fast enough or small enough they will be screened out at the end and again compost is not going to save the day because we want healthy compost we want healthy soil we want to put that back into our earth and we don't want it full of a bunch of inert stuff that um, that doesn't really improve our ecosystem. So again, you circle back, do all the math, do the Venn diagrams, you're gonna end up with saying reuse is the way to go. So just how do we get there? In looking at a COVID-19 world, I'm hoping we get to the point where we do get to say a post-COVID world, but I think we now know that pandemics and viruses are, now that we know it can happen, we know it can happen again. So what are we gonna do? We are up against an extremely strong industry. Uh, the plastics industry is, um, their lobbying groups are very well mobilized. They retain a lot of experts and they're deep pocketed. And they were able to move very quickly during COVID. Uh, the middle of March, they were able to get to the Department of Health and Human Services and the FDA, and they absolutely affected when the CDC put out guidelines for reopening so that they were actually um, suggesting strongly, it was the number one for a restaurant reopening that disposables should be used. And somehow they very easily were able to craft a message and get it out there quickly that not only was disposable where more sanitary, that somehow that became synonymous with sterile. Uh, there's nothing particularly sanitary about the supply chain of disposables, but it certainly isn't sterile. So the good news is, is yes, there's a lot of evidence that shows that reuse is completely safe. And that's where we do depend on our health departments. And we just have to build confidence back up. And I think we will get through this. So in our delivery systems, um, we, these are improvements. Again, no ex accessories was already part of uh, the Berkeley, the, the opt-in for our delivery platforms and in our uh, bricks and mortars that was in it. But this is becoming more and more important as we've seen so much delivery happen. And we're looking at uh, really trying to mandate uh, reusable options in the takeout world and to make a, a closed network. And we are, you know, we've seen, we've actually seen this before. Um, it's been piloted, I'll talk about it next, in, in North Carolina, in Durham, North Carolina. We had a lot of entrepreneurs that were in this field, but now we really need to, to see it happening much faster in takeout, because I do think that takeout is going to be here to stay for quite a while. And uh, let's see, in the new businesses, I wanted to point this out, because this is Dishcraft. This is a robotics company down in the Silicon Valley, and they were doing China durable wear and uh, delivering it to Silicon Valley campuses, offices, events, you know, these closed network systems, and they're capable of, of washing thousands per minute and sanitizing them. And they actually pivoted quickly to be able to do a polypropylene container that is now going to restaurants for takeout. And then again, looking at government facilities about where they can um, mandate, which you'd think would be easy because it's the government. And um, so looking at things that we're now actually seeing in 
accommodated by airports and things like that because refill, refill systems are really key to this. So let's see, safety reusables. I kind of covered that, but we have no confirmed cases that come from surface contact. This is not, COVID is, is aerosol uh, transmission. It is not surface contact. I, I feel it breaks my heart that what a red herring this was about how many people sanitized and what fear there was around reusable bags. Um, but we have had health departments keeping us safe for an awful long time from the, the truly dangerous pathogens that exist on surfaces. And that is why we have strong health protocols. And that's why that sign in the bathroom every time you go there that says employees need to wash their hands, there you go. We have a lot of things in place that have been keeping us safe. So reusables and even BYO, bring your own, that, that can be done safely. And again, it saves money. So we pretty much have to keep pushing that forward because that's what businesses want to know. We just need to convince them. And this is Rethink Disposable. They were very, very helpful when we were doing our presentations to the community because we presented the problem, which was uh, Martin Bork from Ecology Center, who's one of our city partner recycling haulers for residential. And that man has seen an awful lot of plastic go nowhere and experienced the, um, the ups and downs of that market. So we were able to present the problem and then Vice Mayor Hahn was able to present how we were going to solve it through policy. And then Rethink Disposable was there to tell us exactly how we could enact this. And they offer, they're a nonprofit, they're a program of clean water action. And um, they are working on a variety of pilots right now that are looking at institutions until we can figure out how many of our restaurants can reopen and what we have to do. So they're a wonderful organization and I strongly suggest, uh, suggest checking them out. Um, the amount of savings of actual foodware items that are kept out of landfill is huge. And if we can just get people to hang in there a little bit, um, three months, six months, definitely by a year, the, the food service providers would realize how much money they saved by switching to a reusable. So there are many case studies on this and it's very helpful when you have to convince your, uh, your government or your consumers or your food service providers that this that reusable can work. BYO. Now I'm a big fan of BYO because it makes sense to me. And I think that well-designed things that have a long lifespan should be reused again and again and again. In our uh, Berkeley ordinance, uh, we do allow food service providers to turn away anything that seems dangerous or unsanitary. So if it's chipped, broken, cracked, or just really gross, uh, they don't have to. I did hear um, that anecdotally, uh, there's at least 50 and counting of, of cafes that are accepting reusables in New York across the different boroughs. And that is really heartening to hear is that people that were committed to reusables are still uh, using, they're, they're allowing the BYO mugs and they're using a contactless pour so that they are able to comply with the health department mandates. We do know that the charges in these policies, they do impact behavior. And we know that a 25 cent charge is much more effective than a 10 cent charge. We also know that the charges are more impactful than discounts, but you must consider discounts in certain cases because it does help address equity issues by someone getting to bring their own. They may not have access to some of the necessary technology that would allow reusable systems, which includes, includes QR codes or having to put deposits down, which means having a bank account, et cetera, smartphones. Um, also, I was in Los Angeles briefly on the weekend and I went to a Starbucks and I did not have a reusable because I never try anymore because I've been turned down too often. But I noticed a woman in front of me had one and I asked her why and uh, asked the woman if they were accepting it. And she said, no, but you can have a discount if you show us your reusable. And I thought that was remarkable because they're still allowing 10 cent discounts there at Starbucks because this, this store, and I can't figure out if it's a corporate policy, but they did say that it was because um, they felt that they had sold people on this idea of buying a reusable, getting a discount, and they wanted to honor that because they wanted to keep the good behavior going. And so from upstream, I will point out, we know BYO is great, but 
it's, it's even better when we have these systems that will serve customers so they don't generate waste. And if we have more systems in place that are more affordable and more easily accessible, then we are not relying on customers to have to remember to bring something. And we did have a houseless person speak at the end of um, a session of the last meeting at council. And he basically said, I live in the streets. I have my own reusable cup. I want to use that. And I don't want to live in litter. And that is the name. The, type, the, the name of our ordinance is a single use foodware and litter reduction ordinance. So that was really, really impactful to me to hear someone say, I'll take a cup, I'll take a reusable cup on my own to a place. It's better than me living in a bunch of, of fast food that is in the street, of fast food, you know, discards that are in the street. Don't Waste Durham is an organization that has, um, they have, they have driven this the other way. They're in a preemptive law state, so they can't ban anything at a local level. So they're a nonprofit that's just decided to get together and make this happen on their own, and they're pushing for policy, and they're now working to see what they can do with these preemptive laws, even up to the state level, so North Carolina can redefine what solid waste is, as is written into um, their state code. So that they launched their own takeout system. And they've had it since 2007, and they have these boxes, which um, you see from different companies. And they have a, sub a subscriber membership model, and they have a very high return rate, very little leakage, and they've been doing it uh, with, they have kiosks they put out. So this is a way you can drive policy through activism and through nonprofits, driving it the other way if you don't have a strong enough government uh, that, or a committed enough government. And now they're launching one for pizza, and they're prototyping that. And they're doing one for reusable bags, which is fantastic because we want we bag bands got rolled back and now they're they're mostly are back in place, and they are uh, doing a same reusable system where they're servicing it through sanitizing them with volunteer help and uh, materials that have been donated, and again a wonderful wonderful equitable solution, and um, so we can see that in bags as well as foodware. So. Um, there's so many things going on. This is from Samantha Summer, the uh, Director of Business Innovation Development at uh, Upstream. She used to be with uh, Rethink. She was help, very helpful in us uh, passing the ordinance and getting the word out. Look what's going on. So much great stuff. Um, containers, cups, refills, apps. It's just fantastic. And like remark.eco, just these, so important to engage everyone to to make this all accessible and to to build a synergy that moves it forward they're doing a pilot program with i mentioned dishcraft robotics who pivoted uh, they did this fantastic they pivoted to take out containers that were polypropylene and it's based on a kind of a library like checking out books and everything is restocked clean um, safe and you know safe and sanitary and the restaurants just have a supply and then uh, they will drop the dirty containers back at the restaurants. So right now it's free to customers and there's a 50% charge to the food service provider. So we're, the, the idea is that uh, Samantha's running this and looking at the data and we'll continue to improve on these as more pilots uh, happen, how to make them better, how to expand them and uh, get, them, get them going in, in larger areas. Because as I said, a good ordinance has it does have this as one of the features is that there is going to be a citywide program at some point. We have things like dishwashing services that are based on kind of a linen service for a restaurant model where uh, they'll bring you the ware, uh, clean, uh, all different kinds. This company, uh, Farhad was very involved in coming to all of these sessions at Berkeley and saying, I can provide service. Anyone that can't, doesn't have room for a dishwasher or doesn't want to hire the labor, I'll handle it for them. And it's a great model. He can help source, uh, he's even sourcing where for people, special requests. Just again, everyone I know is passionate about trying to make this happen. And he is giving green jobs, which is fantastic, especially for a city like ours. We need more jobs for, um, for the people in our city. Everyone needs more jobs. And that's a very simple thing about how it, uh, how it works through. Very easy. Sparkle is doing something so Sparkle is a uh, formerly GoBox. Um, a lot of people knew GoBox. GoBox is one of the original uh, uh, original purveyors of this service up in um, the, the Northwest. 
And it's been working now for five years. It has a pilot with Whole Foods in one store that's looking, that was looking very good until that hot bar and the, the self-serve bars closed. So again, um, similar containers to what uh, Go, Green to Go is using in Durham. And again, if you, it, there's a business case to be made for all of these people about um, how important it is uh, for the upstream impacts, saving money, um, saving, saving how much stuff has to be hauled around at the end, and again, more green jobs. Dispatch Goods, uh, this was started by some grad students at, um, PhD students at Cal here in Berkeley, and they are piloting, they're using stainless, and they started with a membership model, and they have uh, no problem with getting members. They've had a lot of people sign on. If you want a stainless uh, where that's more their specialty though. They're not they're not in the market of selling where they're a logistics company They're making this happen. They pick up at people's doorsteps uh, Once a week and they're also working with institutions But um, there are cities that just don't want plastic any kind of polypropylene or any other, you know, plastic container so This is someone who specializes more in stainless and that will work for other municipalities that have a you know, certain ethos and progressive element about how they feel about eradicating the use of plastic. They actually are partnering with DoorDash, which is fantastic, where people can opt in, they can get their goods delivered in the stainless, and then they will put it in uh, a bag and dispatch will come pick it up at their door, I think weekly or bi-weekly at this point until it grows. Again, all these people, the, the demand is there, the supply, they're all challenged because they really just need more investment so they can grow. Vessel is what was piloted in Berkeley. And it was doing extremely well in 11 locations. Sadly, half of them were uh, owned by, they were on campus or owned by a campus concessionaire. And um, the campus has, is not going to receive students now until uh, spring. I, no, spring is, no, not till spring. I take it back, I'm sorry, fall of next year. So when we get back up and running, uh, a couple people have shut down completely that were locations. So yes, COVID has impacted it, but I think the most important thing is it was uptrending, getting great feedback, good user retention, and I love that 68% of people, of the vessel users, reported that it inspired them to reconsider their everyday single-use disposable habits across the board, and that was after three weeks. That was like a three-week survey. This is, a, um, this is actually a wonderful uh, hybrid model of both a profit and a nonprofit, and they are doing it themselves. They're in Oakland and they have their own system and the health board was trying to shut them down, but as things move through, the, you just basically rent or buy a jar. If you, it's only a dollar, it's very, very accessible. You can use the jar again at home or bring it back. And um, full disclosure, I'm on the board. We're trying to grow and um, it's, uh, I love what they're doing. This is just take it into your own hands. Do it from um, your, as your own business model. Upstream offers a lot of ways to understand reuse. Um, there's two networks that can be joined, National Reuse Network and the Government Reuse Forum. You would contact Miriam Gordon and um, they would allow you into the networks. There's city campaigns. There's just so much that they offer and it's a great place to, um, to poke around on their website and figure out what applies to you. Here are the contacts of people I've mentioned. Everyone that was in here, I would screenshot it. If I were you, I'll give you a minute. And then I am going to end this and have a few minutes for questions. And I hope I covered, I hope I covered everything, not everything, but I hope I covered what I could that made sense to everybody. And I'm happy to have people follow up with me by email or phone within the next week. And I can uh, see how I could help you in whatever phase you're at or um, I'm a really good connector too. So there we go. Thank you, everybody.